Hey guys, Paul here from Melbourne Performance Coaching and the Complete Personal Trainer Podcast. So in our last podcast, okay, clean the screen, we did the back car. So we talked about back training protocol. So looking, yes, there's a, there's a cat here. Uh, back training protocol. So looking at training the, you know, the upper back, the lats, the mid back, the lower back, etc. All the muscle groups that basically we need to look at from a hypertrophy standpoint. So what I wanted to do today was to go over the upper so not the upper back, middle back, lower back rehab. So how to take someone who's going from acute pain, everyone's just gonna watch this cat being an idiot. Um, take someone from acute pain into taking them back into a performance uh, standpoint. And this is something that's really important to know that as PTs, um, because realistically, we're not like the first port to call for pain. If someone's in agony, we need to know where to refer them to, which is generally a physiotherapist is the best point of call. But we will have clients who do have back pain at some point in, this is hilarious, at some point in our career, because 90 to 95% of people will have back pain in their life. Uh, I personally have had like a pretty horrendous experience of back pain with actually fully bulging a disc, which isn't a pleasant experience. Um, it hurt a lot. But anyway, so moving on. So when someone comes in for low back pain, there's a few things that we need to do. The first thing we need to do is look at the severity and the acuteness of the pain. So if someone comes in a gym and they're in acute low back pain, they can bet they're like bent over at 90 degree angle walking like that. Probably shouldn't be there. They need to go and see a physical therapist or a doctor or somewhere and get the pain under control using pain medication, passive treatments, etc. whatever they can do. Best exercise for them is going to be basic walking and trying to get moving. Any kind of motion is lotion in that situation. Now, once someone is gone a little bit further and they're still in back pain, but they've gone from that, we need to really kind of start looking at the etiology of what's causing the pain. So is it flexion dominant pain? Is it an extension dominant pain? Is it compression? Uh, all these things kind of, what's implicated in this particular human being's pain presentation. And when we can do that, the most important thing we can do is not rule out, but kind of stop the exercises from happening that cause more and more pain. So if someone has flexion-based pain and doing sit-ups, we kind of want to stop them from doing sit-ups for that brief period of time. A lot of people in, uh, like the pain science type realm, I guess, and now just saying like do anything type thing that you're in pain. Doesn't matter if you're, um, you know, if it hurts or whatever, just keep pushing through, it'll be okay. This is a little bit of a misapplication in my thing, in my point of view. I believe that you should push through a little bit of pain, but I don't think you should do the movements that actually lead to directional aggravation of the problem. And from there, once you figure out where someone's direction of pain is and something I teach in my course, we can then start to develop a corrective exercise program to actually strengthen them in the areas that they need to get stronger at. So very often it's not really a problem of stretching their back more, it's actually strengthening their back and getting it working better to handle the loads that it needs to do. But you also want to look at things like mobilizing the hip joint, mobilizing the thoracic spine and getting all those things working out. Now with low back, a lot of people will go straight to the medial free and anti-movements like anti-extension, anti-rotation, anti-side flexion and anti I missed one, flexion, I think I missed, but nevertheless. So people will go to those types of movements as part of their low back training pro protocol, which is all well and good if you integrate it with some hip mobility work and actually loading up the glutes and hamstrings and building those muscles up to help solidify the glutes. Some people will go down the track of the PRI route, getting people to breathe into a balloon or breathe out forcefully and contract and get their obliques working properly and fix up that angle of the ribs and create kind of like a posterior tilt if someone's in the anterior tilt. Not really the best option if someone's got a disc bulge, putting them further into posterior tilt. Uh, we need to look at things a little bit more intelligently than that. But what we need to do, first and foremost, is keep people moving, give them some basic spinal exercises like bird dogs, etc., which I talked about in the last podcast, to stop atrophy of the multifidi muscles. Now, the multifidus is a small muscle that goes from spine segment to segment. It is a segmental stabilizer of lumbar spine. So we need to make sure that we don't get atrophy of that muscle. We can do some planks, some side planks, some curl ups, et cetera, to start training the core muscles. But what we need to do is really help someone manage their pain up until that four week mark. At the four week mark, if someone's been in pretty bad pain for that amount of time, their likelihood of becoming a chronic pain patient is a ton higher. And chronic pain is, it's terrible. So what we wanna do is avoid that. Once we hit that uh, mark, there's a really good book, Rehabilitation of the 
Spine by Craig Leverson goes through that. I think it's in the second chapter, uh, how to actually identify if someone's going to go down that chronic pain route. Because if they do, it, you create like sensitization, you create uh, movement avoidance, there's all these other problems there. You need to refer them to someone who's like an expert in pain, like straight away and go from there. Now with the lower back, once we've got someone out of that basic level, we need to do a couple of things. First one is to make sure we screen their movement so we can do the appropriate movement variations that they can do and get stronger in them. Now, some people will say at this point, oh, you may as well just give them full deadlifts. Well, if they don't have the capacity to do a full deadlift, we're not gonna give them a full deadlift and just force that. We may as well take a minute to actually look at someone, how they move, so we can figure out what co coaching tools we might need, what other exercises they may need to do, what other exercises they should avoid doing, and actually give them my cat a proper approach to working in their program now once we've done that and we've done their program for a period of time we want to get them stronger in a few different things once they're pain-free so they're pain-free they're lifting properly again they're probably at a higher level of fitness than what they were muscularly uh musculoskeletally a few things you want to do first one is address aerobic fitness so sounds really weird for low back pain but increased levels of aerobic fitness and will lead to better quality of life and also lower reincidence of back pain. So helping someone get aerobically fit is a very good strategy for doing that. It also has the benefit of keeping a couple of kilos off them as well, because if people do enough of it, they generally tend to lose uh, some weight as long as they don't change their diet. That being said, it's not the only solution, but stick with me here. Uh, from there, what we want to do is then start training them in the direction that they got injured. And this sounds really wrong and terrible, but what we want to do is we want to build up a more resilient body in the end and all tissues adapt. So the example for me would be a disc bulge. Okay. I've done a disc bulge, uh, cool, it's a flexion-based injury. I train Jefferson curls. The reason why I train Jefferson curls is so I can build up some resilience and some tolerance to spinal flexion. It's intelligently done. It's progressed uh, very slowly under load. If I feel any pain, I obviously stop straight away because there's no benefit to it. But what happens uh, with that is it, re it desensitizes me, pardon me, to the movement pattern on the lumbar flexion. It also allows me to control it and to get segmental stability in that movement pattern. So. If I have an extension-based pain, I'll do some back extension stuff or looking at building someone into a back bridge, for example, or something like that. It doesn't matter what so much, but what we're trying to do is aim for that direction of which they suffer, uh, in which they feel pain in, and from there, build up tolerance over time to help remove fear avoidance and let them know that they're gonna be okay. The third, I think it's the third and final thing that I'll discuss today is then to then be aware that that muscle group and that muscle, that area has a lower maximal recoverable volume. And the reason being is that there has been a tissue injury there. So there is some kind of, there are some fibers, there are some areas that are more susceptible to stress and loading. So my deadlift ca capacity in terms of how often I can do a deadlift per week has reduced since the back pain. My strength hasn't reduced uh, significantly at all. It has in terms of the fact I just haven't trained deadlifts heavy because it's not part of the program at the moment, but my ability to recover from heavy deadlifts is lower since the injury. And with a lot of clients who have experienced back pain, uh, their recovery for axial loading may be a little bit lower. So from there, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's kind of like, um, you know, so, saying that because someone's a cyclist and they've done so much quad work that they've got a higher capacity for quad work makes it harder to hypertrophy. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It is, is what it is. So when someone does have an injury, we need to make sure, we need to be aware that that part of the body may not have as much tolerance as it used to have. So what we need to do is we need to be aware of that, err on the side of less is more, and from there we can actually build them up strength-wise back to the same. I've pulled. I've pulled over 200 kilos since the back injury. So yeah, it uh, wasn't like an incredible, like 270, 280 kilo deadlift. That was like a 220, 240. I pulled over 200, but I haven't actually trained the movement. So you can get back up there. But again, the recovery from each session is a little bit less than what it used to be. So guys, there's some insights on how to work with low back pain. Hopefully you found some value from it. Any questions, let me know. Love to speak to you more. And I'll be back tomorrow with another body part cast, maybe a bycast. cast.